Hi folks, uh, we're going to shoot an Earth Tools service video here. We're going to talk about servicing on a BCS brand double action sickle bar or cutter bar. Cutter bar and sickle bar are interchangeable terms. Anyway, uh, I've been putting this video off for a couple of years now, so I figured it was finally time to do it. Um, we've got the double action 59 inch bar pictured here. Um, this is our most popular selling double action bar. This is the one with the uh, rock guards or fingers sticking out in front. The, the, uh, the guarded style, that's our most popular style. But the service techniques that go into this video will pretty much work for any of the double action sickle bars. And I'll also point out as we go along what aspects of this apply to the single action sickle bars as well. So this thing is just kind of thrown together right now. I've already removed the bolts that hold the hood on. Uh, normally you've got a bolt and a nut going through the top and a bolt going into the bottom. The bolt that goes into the bottom to hold the shield on is slightly tapered on the bottom of the head, so that's a specialized bolt. That's because when this sickle, when the hood is tightened down and the, the thing is oscillating back and forth, this thing actually wags back and forth a little bit because there's a rubber bushing in here that allows some flex. So this bolt is designed to be tight. You, you go ahead and tighten it to full torque and that rubber bushing provides the flex necessary, but the, the head is ground away here so that the bottom sides of the head doesn't eat into the plastic housing as the thing rocks. So that's specific bolt. Uh, at the top, you've got a, a, just a standard bolt and two washers and a lock nut. The way they want that assembled, they want a lock washer under the head of the bolt and the other lock washer here. And that actually, that washer gets pinched between the underside of the hood and the bracket, and then the nut goes on the bottom. Again, you tighten that to full torque, uh, and you, the, the rubber bushing on the inside takes care of the flex. Some people think you need to leave these bolts slightly loose because of the oscillation of this arm, but no, they'll, they'll rattle out in 15 minutes. The other thing to note is on some sickle bars, single and double action, you will find a spacer on the lower bolt. Um, now the single action bars actually have a longer bolt that passes all the way through this arm and has a nut on the bottom. The double action don't. The double action are threaded into this so the bolt actually threads in here. But point is if there's a spacer present, if you find a spacer when you take yours apart, where it goes is underneath here. It actually spaces between the rubber bushing and the top of the blade drive arm here. Some people find the spacer and they just put it on top. Well, it doesn't do any good at all. It's, it's not spacing anything up there. So if you find the spacer, put it on the bottom. This particular one does not need a spacer. I just happened to grab this out of inventory to show this in the video. But if you've got a spacer, use it. Because if, you, if one is designed for a spacer and it's not there, what will happen is this, this hood, when you tighten it down, will run so low, it'll actually rub the bottom of the plastic on this blade coupling here and, and kind of mess up your plastic. And since these, car, these hoods are like $150, you don't want to be messing them up. It's some kind of super space age high impact plastic. So anyway, get that out of the way for now. Um, we are going to, I'm going to show you kind of the, uh, some of the, uh, the high, high wear areas on these sickle bars. One is your blade coupling. The, the blade coupling here uh, is what your drive arm fits into. The blade coupling is bolted to the top of the moving cutter, or the moving cutter blade. And it, we call it a coupling because it, this piece is coupling the blade to the drive arm. And as a result of that, this thing takes a lot of abuse. It goes back and forth like six or seven hundred times a minute uh, when you're using the machine. So these bolts take a lot of stress. And if you're out there mowing for days on end, you would be very well advised to put a wrench on these and make sure they're tight. Now look, these were not completely tight. This is the way this thing rolled in here. But look, I'm, I'm putting some, I got a, almost a quarter turn on that one or a little over an eighth of a turn, maybe an eighth of a turn on that one. So now it's fully tight. Now, if I wanted to remove the blade for servicing, I would remove these two bolts, and I will do that in a minute. But let me point out that there are also some, uh, some bolts on the back here holding the, the rear blade coupling in place. The rear blade coupling is the one that couples the lower drive arm, this little bitty drive arm, to the lower blades. The lower blades are the ones with the guards on them. 
Typically, the lower blade assembly doesn't get beat up as much. Those teeth are much heavier, and it's the top teeth that take the abuse typically. But occasionally, you should put a wrench on these, make sure they're good and tight. That one actually has a head that's been defaced a little bit, but uh, so I'll probably replace that bolt later. Uh, this is actually a, a sickle bar that came in on trade. Uh, the other thing that you're going to want to check pretty often is these nuts here because these are the nuts that link the entire gearbox body to the, the blade, uh, kind of the frame of the blade assembly. You've got two great big studs and nuts here, one on each side. They take a 22 millimeter wrench and you should definitely put a wrench on those. Now I just put them on hand tight uh, because this sickle bar came in in pieces when it shipped UPS. So I haven't tightened these down yet, but normally you would crank these down. Hey, actually, before I do that, I'm going to take the opportunity to show you something. If you ever have these nuts off, the washer that's under them looks like a flat washer, but it's not. I don't know if the camera will show this, but this is actually a conical lock washer. It's slightly cone-shaped on the top. That is, it, it's kind of curved upward. This is a little convex here, and this is, um, this is a slight upward cone. The way it's designed to be installed is with the cone end up. That way when the nut compresses it down, it actually mashes the center of the washer down and puts the threads of the nut under tension. This helps lock the nut in place. So if you install it upside down with the cone kind of facing down, it doesn't do any good. It's got to be always on a, on a conical lock washer. You always want the cone facing the, tight, the, the head of the fastener that's tightening it down, in this case the nut. So anyway, you would crank this down. And basically, you get these as tight as you physically can. I mean, these suckers need to be tight. Uh, a lot of times, if I have the sickle bar on the floor, I will actually kick these things. You can also use like a half inch impact wrench. If you're gonna put a torque wrench on, these things should be 100 foot pounds. Okay, tight. Get the one on the other side here. Actually, I don't need to bore you with this. You've already seen me get one side tight. I'll tighten that later with more off video. Okay, so the whole gearbox of these double action sickle bars is in an oil bath. So there's 80, 90 weight gear oil inside this gearbox. There's a check plug on the top. Simply remove the plug with a 17 millimeter wrench, put a, a wire or a screwdriver or something down into there or a zip tie, whatever. Uh, actually, a bent piece of wire is better because you won't accidentally drop it in. And just make sure that the thing is about one-third full. Uh, it doesn't have to be half full. Typically on a gearbox, half full is the rule of thumb. But uh, since this gearbox is actually much larger on the bottom half of the gearbox than it is on the top half of the gearbox, one-third full is plenty. Check it once a year. There's one grease fitting on the tail end here, which should be greased once per year. That's the grease fitting that lubricates this little swivel joint here. That's the swivel joint that allows the sickle bar to float to match the ground contours separate from the tractor. So that doesn't get a whole lot of travel. You just grease that with a grease gun until grease oozes out around this joint right here. You can see old grease here, so it's been greased. Other places that you can grease on the sickle bar, on the double action, is right here and here. Now that's not on the older double action sickle bars. Somewhere around 2014, BCS added these two grease fittings. These used to be areas that were not greased. Basically what this is, these are greasing the blade drive bushing. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and take the opportunity of taking this blade coupling off now so we can see that blade drive bushing a little better. This is part of the process I would go through to remove the bolt anyway, which we are going to remove this blade because it needs repair. So we're going to take these two bolts out. This blade coupling just slides right off. And then these things are exposed a little better. So uh, this is another area that you should often check. You notice how this nut is loose? Well, the person who owned this did never check that nut because that's a, that's a wear area. Again, this arm is moving that blade back and forth five or 600 times a minute, and that bolt right there, it's actually a stud that comes up through the bottom of this blade arm, takes a hell of a lot of beating. So you wanna put a wrench on that every now and then, that's a 17 millimeter, and make sure it's tight. Uh, this person did not, and the thing worked itself loose. Now that may have damaged the inside of this blade drive arm because that stud has been kind of watering around in there. It doesn't feel like there's too much wear though, so we might be okay. But at any rate, 
inside this blade drive bushing, kind of between the outer part of the bushing and the inner stud that comes through it, there is a needle bearing, and that needle bearing needs grease, which is why they introduced these little grease zerks kind of coming out at an angle. If you see the grease zerk, grease it. They should be greased every probably six to eight hours of use. Just two pumps is enough with a grease gun. You don't want to put globs of grease everywhere that's going to attract a bunch of dirt. But um, the older type uh, drive arms on the, do on the double action sickle bars from BCS did not use the bearing. They had simply a, a squared off, you know, blade drive bushing on the outside and then the pin going through the inside and it was just metal on metal. It had no bearing. You just gave it a shot of penetrating oil every now and then to keep it going. Um, in my estimation, the older ones actually held up better. These needle bearings, I think, are a little fragile. They really don't take the beating as well as the solid uh, steel ones did. But that's what's on all the new machines. So if you have a, a needle bearing, please keep it greased. Otherwise, you're going to be putting new ones in. They're not cheap. Uh, and if you break the needle bearings and you want to go back to the older style system, it retrofits right into these newer style arms. There's the, the taper on the bottom of this where this pin cinches in there is the same taper. Anyway, so we're going to, I'm going to get this blade out of here. Uh, so that I can get under here and tighten this thing. Right now there's not enough clearance for me to get on the bottom of this and hold this. There's a, there's a squared off place in the bottom I need to hold in order to tighten this nut. But at any rate, I'm going to grab the little, what, they, what BCS calls a duplex tool. Isaac, you can back up a little bit so people can see me a little bit. Isaac is filming here. Thank you, Isaac. So this, this little tool uh, we call it the duplex tool simply because BCS calls this type of sickle bar, that is the double action sickle bar, they call it a duplex. I don't know why. People, uh, they thought it was a cool name, but it makes people think they can only mow down duplexes and not single, or not single residence homes. So anyway, this, if you've purchased your duplex double action sickle bar new, uh, then this tool would have come in the toolkit. And people say, what the Zark is it? Well, it's for these spring-loaded tensioners. These are the tensioners that are pushing the upper blade down against the lower blade so that you get a nice scissor action cut between the two. Because, of course, you know, you need two things for a sickle bar to cut. You need sharp blades and you need tight blades. If you have a scissors that's sharp but the joint is real loose and the blades are kind of floppy, it just folds the paper over it. You know, just it doesn't actually cut it. So on the single action sickle bars, most of the BCS single action sickle bars uh, have manual blade tensioners that you have to just adjust every now and then. And we cover that in our single action sickle bar video. The double actions all come with these spring loaded tensioners and they're sweet because you never have to think about them. But you do have to think about them when you want to take the blade out. So that's where this comes in. You slide it in like that and just flex the spring loaded tensioner up detaching this socket from the hole there and just swing it off to the side. Just do that all across. I mean different types of sickle bars have different numbers of these tensioners. The 59 inch has six of them. Sometimes these tensioners will break. They're replaced easily with just one bolt at the back. And if you buy a new one of these things it actually comes with one of these spare in the toolkit. So now that's that up, that's off of there and we've removed our blade coupling already thing just slides right out. Now, we've got a bent blade at the end here, so I'm going to have to slide it out this way. It's pretty, pretty good and bent. I'm going to whack it with a hammer to get it under that guard. In fact, I'll smack this under there. There we go. Now that we're clear, we'll just slide the whole thing out. There we go. All right, there's our blade assembly. So we've got uh, all the blades are held on by rivets. You've got uh, two rivets each. And you've got rivets going through various things here. You've got some rivets that are short that are going through just the strip and the blade. You've got some rivets that are longer because they go through the strip, the blade, and these little socket pieces where the, where the socket, the spring-loaded tensioners lock in. And then you've got some where it go through the strip, the blade, and this center portion, which is the blade coupling strip. That's what our blade coupling bolted down to. This has the drilled and tapped holes in it. So, uh, three different rivet lengths on the double action sickle bars. You've got 12 millimeters here, 
14 millimeters here and 16 millimeters here. So if you're ordering new rivets, you want to stock up on a few of them, like 16 cents a piece from Earth Tools. So uh, you know you can throw a few spares in the, in the toolbox. So now we're going to take some of these teeth off. Um, some of these things have been beat up. Uh, I notice right here. See, there's a there's a step right here between these two teeth. Now that's kind of suspicious because that tells me that either there's been a bunch of wear transpiring right here behind this one or these rivets are partially sheared. I think it's wear actually. I'll have to check this sickle bar out to see what's going on with that. But, um, but anyway, I can see that there's a lot, uh, if, compared to this tooth here, there's a lot of space between the hole and the back of the tooth and here there's hardly any. So I think it's, this has been worn away at the back. That would correspond to being right here under this clamp. So they might have just been using this in some really abrasive soil conditions and uh, you know got some sand jam back in there and wore the back off the teeth. That's not a big deal. The clamp still uh, inserts over the top of that. It's going to hold it down. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. The front side of those teeth is pretty good. They're tight. And you always want to check your teeth for tightness because you know, loose teeth will just waller themselves out. They'll, they'll waller the strip and the holes in the teeth. The holes in the teeth are no big deal. The teeth are like three bucks each, but if you have to replace the strip, well, that's very expensive and very labor intensive because you don't have to drill all these rivets out. So you want to keep those holes round. Uh, we'll go down this line here. Everything seems tight. Okay, they've busted one tooth off here, and then we've got that end tooth, which is busted off. That must have jumped out and hit something right at the end of the bar. They're a little more susceptible, and it's actually bent the blade assembly itself. You can see that that thing's no longer straight. So the first thing we're going to do is get that tooth off of there. Now with the single action sickle bars, uh, a lot of those are configured in such a way that it's, it's a little bit of a pain to get the teeth off. Usually you have to grind the rivet heads off or drill the rivet heads off. On the double action bars and on some of the, on some of the single action bars, particularly the new laser bars that BCS came out with in the single action, and uh, some of your really, really old mulching style bars that BCS had. Uh, you can get them off an easier way. And that is by essentially shearing the rivets off using kind of a guillotine uh, uh, approach that an old farmer showed me once. Uh, and and you, basically you can do this on any sickle bar where the tooth projects past the back of this strip. See, a lot of the BCS sickle bars, single action particularly, the, the tooth kind of ends right at the back of the strip. There's nothing projecting past. Well, if you've got any projecting surface past the back of the strip, you can use this guillotine method. What we're going to do first is put some eye protection on because you're going to have parts flying around. Isaac, you'll have to hide behind the camera. So we're going to take a vise. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's probably not going to be that many flying parts. You can put on eye protection if you want. So we're going to take a vise and we're going to open it up just a slit. Just enough, essentially. Okay, you might want to come around the other side, Isaac. Just enough to get a tooth drop down through it so that the strip that every, all the teeth are riveted to kind of comes down against the solid portion of the vise. And I, this is the way you want it. That is, I want the strip resting on the solid body of the vise, not the jaw of the vise. Because this thing moves. This is solid. So I'm resting that on some nice solid surface. Now I'm going to take a hammer and I'm going to smack the back of this right about where the rivets are. And what that's going to do is it's going to, the, the tooth itself will shear that rivet off. This is the same thing that happens when you go out and hit a rock and shear your rivets off. And the head of the rivet's going to fly off. Gone. There are the rivets. Actually, the bottom half of the rivet flew out. The top half is still stuck in there, but that's okay. We'll just uh, open this vise up a smidge and drive these old pieces of rivet out. Get out, rivet. The stubborn bugger. It's moving now. Man. Well, this is what you're going to deal with at home, so it's good you're having to see me struggle with it. Don't know why the 
this thing is so stuck in here. Factory must have really whaled this thing in here. Take these glasses off because I can't see what I'm doing. In fact, I'm going to put on my reading glasses because, uh, yes, okay, so. Hmm, it's moving. Man, that did not want to come out. But we got it. I'm not taking no for an answer. You want to use a punch that's as close to the size of the ribbon as possible. That is, if you use a punch that's too small, it'll just kind of jam down into the rivet and spread the rivet out. So, that got those out of there. Probably it jammed those in there extra tight because of the way that that end is smashed in place there. It squirt, just kind of scrunched that thing up. Now we're going to straighten out the bar. Let's clamp this bar in the vise, like so, and I'm going to tweak it back into shape. This, this strip is relatively mild steel. It's not hardened. So it will usually bend and then come back into shape. Little, oops, there got my glasses. A little smack there. I got my glasses, so I'll smash them. And then we'll sight down the length of the bar to see if we've got it straight. It's straighter. lever here. Okay, I felt it bend there. It felt a lot better. Oh yeah, that looks nice. That's straight. But I can also see that sighting down it, there's actually a bend right about here where, I don't know, something something got smacked at some point. You always, whenever you've got one of these out, you always sight down it and see what's going on with it. So I'm going to put this right there on the corner. Just kind of bend it a little bit. Yep, came right back. Actually, I overbent it just a hair. Yeah, that looks nice. So, and we're also going to sight down it this way. That is, looking at it not only this way on the strip, but this way. Because sometimes, if you have one of these ends that gets bent badly, it can actually bend it forward or backwards there. That's a little harder to bend, but usually we put a little heat to it and you can bring it back. But that, that looks nice and straight. So I don't think there's any problem there. So, next thing we're going to do is grab a wire brush and just kind of clean off the bottom of these teeth a little bit. And so when we put it back on the main body of the thing against the lower teeth, we don't have any grass stuck in here that's messing up our, our surface, our surface to surface, or our surface contact, I should say. So that wasn't bad. Sometimes there's a huge buildup down here, but this one really wasn't that bad. So I'm going to scrape off where the teeth need to go. Now there was still a tooth here, so that one's nice and clean. But here where there's been a tooth missing a little while, look, we've got some built up grass there. And if I was just to take a, a new tooth and just slap it right on there and rivet it in place, I'd be trapping that grass between there. And guess what? That tooth wouldn't stay sharp or it wouldn't stay tight very long because I'd be tightening the, the surfaces down against grass, which would work its way out from in between there and then the tooth would loosen up. So we'll get it down to metal there. And hit it with the wire brush in the corners. Okay, now we've got some sheared off rivets in there to deal with. So we'll have to get those out of there too. But I'll do that later. I don't need to bore you with that. You see, you see what the procedure is. Now the thing is, when you're driving those rivets in and out, you do have to keep track of what is on the other side of the bar. Now here where I was driving these on the other, uh, in, uh, in the vise here a minute ago, it was just the rivet itself and the strip. So I could just turn that over, open the vise up enough for the head of the rivet to sit between the vise jaws and drive the thing out. 
Well, sometimes you got these sockets here, so you got to put the socket up on top. Uh, and you just, you know, just, you know, open your vise or, or brace the thing up because sometimes if you don't see, I had a workbench here, but if you don't have anything else to hold this up, it's kind of a pain. Uh, having a, an adjustable stand or something or a chair you can prop under here to hold this up at the right level, you know, so it's even with the top of the vise is helpful. But anyway, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and rivet a new tooth on the end bar here so we can get that portion of this thing fixed. Now on the double action sickle bars, the rivets go down from the top. This is the opposite of just about all the single action bars, although I think the new laser single action bars are made like this. Um, so we're going to put this like this. These teeth go down, or I'm sorry, the rivets go down from the top, like so. And actually, I'm kind of assembling this stupidly, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this over. Uh, Isaac, I'm going to switch places with you. You come over to this side of the vise. And I set this on here like that. So the rivet goes down first. And actually, I'll just take both of my rivets and put them here. Isaac is trying not to smash my glasses. Thank you, Isaac. Of course, I might need them because I can't see. Let's see here. I should tape these to my head. Thank you. Can I open them one-handed is the question. The answer is yes after 14 tries. Okay, so we've got that on there. I'm putting this blade on upside down because the whole thing is upside down. And you see that there are chamfered holes in the bottom of that tooth. Well, you're driving these rivets, you're kind of filling up that chamfer or tapered hole uh, with the heads of the rivet. Can you hand me that ball-peen hammer? I think? Thank you. All right, now for this, you're going to use the ball end of the ball-peen hammer. The ball end will smash that rivet out. It will sort of mushroom it. And that's what we want. This will lag around a little bit on there, but as soon as I mushroom that head a little bit, it can't get off. So, I'll start working on this one a little bit. Now, this procedure is slightly different than on the single action bars uh, in the sense that on the single action bars uh, you drive down the rivet with the ball peen end or the ball end and then you finish it off with the flat ends that compress the stem of the rivet. We're going to do that a little bit but only at the very end on these things. Uh, get that head rolling down really good. Get a good mushroom going on the head. that head out good. Now the tooth, the tooth is trapped in place. Can't get off of that. Make sure the heads of your rivet are firmly against the anvil of your vise. And this is a really small anvil. This is kind of inconvenient to use. If you have a bigger anvil on your vise, vise it makes it a lot better. And right here at the very end, I'm going to turn this over and kind of mash it down kind of compress the stem of the rivet and swell the stem of the rivet out so it fills up the hole. And see it's just mashed out into that chamfer, filling it up completely. If you use a rivet that's longer than what you need for the particular position that you've put the tooth in, you just can't drive it all the way down. There'll be some material, there'll be like a bump sticking up out of there. If, that's, if that happens, you know, if, you, if the only rivets you have in stock are too long, it's okay. You can go ahead and mash it down until it fills up the chamfer and then just take a grinder and grind off the excess. It should be pretty smooth there. I mean, there can be a little bit sticking out. I mean, this has maybe a half a millimeter, but it's, that's perfectly acceptable. So, that's how you replace a tooth on one of these things. Now, the, um, the procedure for replacing teeth at the very center of this thing where this little strip is attached, that's a little more difficult because the head of the rivet, as you can see, let me grab a little bit of a screwdriver here so I can scratch down in here, scratch the dirt away. The heads of some of these rivets are actually countersunk in here. They're in these little recesses. So how can you rest the head of that rivet against your anvil? You can't. You have to 
put a bump of something on your anvil. Some people weld a little spot of weld onto their anvil so they can, it'll kind of stick up into there. The other thing you can do, and I'll illustrate this here with a punch, and, and typically you would use a much larger punch than this. You'd use a, like a 3 8 diameter punch and you take your punch over to the vise. Actually, let me just go get a big punch to illustrate this. Use something like the great big old punch like this, open up a vise, and you stick it all the way down so it's touching at the bottom of your vise uh, jaw right here, or the, the shaft of the vise, and you tighten it down like that. So you've got something sticking up out of there that's nice and solid and big. And then if you needed to, you know, mash some rivets in here to replace these teeth at the center, or if you're replacing the strip itself, you set that countersink right over there, so it's right up against the head of that rivet, and then you can wail on the rivet and smash it down. But that's the way that has to be done. Get this on here. Also, please note that we've got a mixture of parts here in terms of age. This is actually a slightly newer blade coupling. You can see that this has little serrations on the bottom that lock into these little serrations here when this thing is tightened down. But you also see that there's portions that aren't serrated. There's these big kind of open sections. Well, this is an older sickle bar uh, blade assembly that had serrations all the way down. The very latest sickle bars that are coming out have a portion right where the bolts go in that's not serrated. They did that to actually strengthen the threads because if those threads, you know, that the bolts screw into, these bolts here, if those threads are cut into serrated material, there's actually not quite as much metal there. So those first couple, three threads are pretty weak and it gets a little stronger as you get down in there. But BCS made this running change kind of in their sickle bars. They, uh, they eventually took that took that section right where those bolts were and, and did not serrate it and they made these blade couplings to match. Now the newer style blade coupling fits the older sickle bar because it doesn't matter if these serrations go up into these kind of empty spaces. But if you tr buy, if you have an old blade coupling where it's serrated all the way down it, you know, fully serrated and you try to put it on one of the newer sickles that has the non-serrated sections, it won't even go down. It just stops right where those serrations hit the flat and you're stuck. So you can't mix old, let's see, you can't mix old blade couplings with new blades, but you can mix old blades with new blade couplings. So just keep that in mind. Eventually BCS will be phasing out this style and you'll, and you'll have to update your blade coupling. So. Putting this thing back together. Now I know we didn't replace this other tooth. I'll do that off camera later. I don't need to bore you to death. But we're gonna go ahead and slide this thing back in just so I can show you the blade, uh, blade coupling adjustment. So we're sliding that all back in. Comes back in a lot nicer now that that's not bent. Uh, we would go ahead and put our spring tensioners back on, but uh, I mean, that's a super easy job. What you'll typically do is put just a little spot of grease in each one of these little cavities here and then swing these back into place. And in fact, I can demonstrate putting the grease on. Let me grab that little grease, that old grease tube here with a paintbrush in it. Works perfect for these type of things. Just grease it up a little bit. And grease myself too while I'm at it. Grab a rag, take that excess grease off because I don't think I'm gonna rust. Swing it back in, and then there we go. Sometimes you got to tap it or shift the blade around to get it to smash back in. And pushed a little of the grease out, but that's okay. So we'll do that all across the thing later. Um, oh yeah, ha ha! Forgot to tighten that. But, uh, well, let's take care of that while we're here. This thing slid out enough that I can get under this thing. All right. At what size this is under here. Not a 17. Maybe it's a 19. Huh. Actually, you know, I'm going to try just removing that thing. Let's see, where is my zip gun? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and remove this thing. I've got my zip gun here with 17 on it. Get that off. Get this over 
part a little. They've got a brass bushing between here. Actually, I've kind of screwed up because the uh, I showed you how tight I needed to get these bolts here, or these nuts rather, to hold this thing together. Well, <laughs> I got to loosen it up in order to get this thing off. So, best laid plans and all that. This thing is loosened up again. Hold this up enough to get this out from underneath. Okay, so you, as you can see, this is a tapered surface here. It fits into a tapered socket on the bottom of this blade drive arm. There's a little brass bushing in between here and here, and in here is the needle bearing we talked about, which is right in there. Yeah, I can feel the needles. It's all packed with grease right now, so it's hard to see where exactly it is, but that's that's where the needle lives very gritty. So what we're going to do is we're going to rinse that out. We're going to wash that out with our parts washer. Get all the grit out of there. It probably was not greased as often as it should be. The, grit, the grease would have flushed the grit out of there. But this is a squared off portion on the bottom here. You could put a 17 millimeter wrench on to hold it while you tighten down the top. Once the taper bites into the taper in the bottom of this, then you don't even need to hold the bottom. You just crank it down like, a, like tightening a ball joint in a car. I think that will be okay. Let's fit this up into here. Yeah, it's it's still tight enough when I tighten that in. But if you if I was to loosen this up and then the bottom end of it went boom, 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 boom like that, that means that taper is shot because it's run too loose. So anyway, we're gonna get that put back together. Uh, and actually, we're gonna I'm gonna stick this back together temporarily. Uh, boy, the thing's gritty and awful. But I'm going to put it back together, whoops, temporarily just for the video here. We know what we need to do with this. I need to flush it out and clean it and retighten it to specs. Uh, or just replace it with that older style I talked about, which is actually less troublesome than these. But we'll go ahead and tighten this just so I can get through the video here and show you how to tighten that. Uh, the blade coupling properly because that's a that's an important service procedure that you need to know. Where is that thing? Oh, there it is. It's on this side. Duh. Tightened up nice. All right. We can bring these down. Can lock this thing back in position. Good enough for the video. Okay. Now normally. I would take some uh, good lubricant like this fluid film or just some oil and just lubricate everything. I just kind of spray these down a little bit where the, you have these surfaces sliding over one another uh, or paint it with a little oil. So I would just you know, do this, kind of hit the bottoms of these so that when it goes back together it's got some assembly lube and I would go down the whole row like that. But I'm not going to do that now because I'm going to be taking this back apart to replace this other broken tooth. So, I'll slide it through here, get our blade coupling back, make sure it's lined up with the bolt holes, slide it back in, make sure that we've got two flat sides that are going to bear on these inner, inner bolts here. Okay. Okay. We go ahead and crank this thing down fully. Now the really old blade couplings from BCS had an interesting design. They had adjustment bolts going in the sides like this one did, or like this one does. And those adjustment bolts were actually locked in place by these top bolts. Basically the casting here was slit, it was slit through on the back side so that when you tighten this down, it was crimping the housing together and actually pinching this bolt on the inside. Those old blade coupling housings were black. Of course, after they run a while, the paint comes off of all of them. But, but that's how they were made. They did, the, the big identifying feature is they did not have these great big locking nuts on the outside. On these newer ones, starting probably 2010 or so, maybe, I can't remember the exact year, they got rid of that slotted feature and they went uh, with adjustment bolts coming in on the sides with big lock nuts holding them in place. That's a much more robust design because that two-piece kind of slit design allowed some movement and these bolts would loosen up more often. So now we just, we just crank these things down. 
So it should be tightened to about 18 foot pounds. I, that was my uh, my internal torque wrench going off there, the little mm -mm noise. So we've got these, now I actually loosened these up earlier, but when I was off camera, we've got these large locking nuts here, and then we've got, see I've loosened up this one, and then we've got that inner adjusting bolt. What you're adjusting there is the bolts that come in against this blade drive bushing. And this is super important because as this thing wears over time, the blade drive bushing itself wears a little bit and those two adjustment bolts wear and you get a little more slop in there. And when you get slop in there, it rattles and it also vibrates. And it's also much more likely that the blade coupling is gonna shake itself loose because of the extra hammering motion going on in there. So you want to check this adjustment at least once a year, maybe two or three times a year if you're using a sickle bar a lot. And the adjustment is typically you grab a hold of your nose cone and the, and the blue guard can actually be in place. The blue guard comes right over this and it's of course bolted to this arm. So you just grab that nose cone, the whole blue piece, and you wiggle it back and forth. Now see how much slop we've got there? That's way too much slop. The factory says there should be maybe 10 thousandths of an inch. My rule of thumb is you should be able, if you wiggle it back and forth, you should be able to hear movement, but not really see movement. That's about 10 thousandths. That's kind of the, if you don't have the, uh, the measuring tools kind of thing, that's what you do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten this inner bolt. I'm going to hold this outer one loose. I'm going to tighten the inner bolt until it comes down snug. Now there's zero play. Well, that's bad because you have to have a little bit of play there because as it heats up, the metal expands, you don't want parts to seize. So I tightened it all the way until it came snug, and then I'm going to back it off about an eighth of a turn. And then I'm going to go ahead and tighten this jam nut into place. And you don't have to adjust both sides every time. That is, they have two sides here. But you adjust one, one side one time, one side the next time, and just keep the adjustment bolts more or less even. And the phone is ringing, but we are closed right now, so I'm not going to answer. We'll put it over here. Bye, phone. Actually, I'll just turn it off. I think that should shut it up. So now that I've loosened that up a little bit, there it is. Now I can see a little bit of movement there. See that? That's barely anything, though. And I'm going to try to tighten it up a little more. I'm going to try to get it a little tighter. Back out this adjustment bolt, or rather the nut. Screw this in just a hair. Yeah, I may have it too tight. No, I can hear it. Barely, barely. That's, that's on the edge of being too tight. But I'm gonna redo this anyway because I'm gonna take this thing back apart and flush out that bearing. But you see what the specs are. You wanna be able to barely hear it not really see it, but you should be able to detect some movement by moving it back and forth. Now keep, keep in mind that also you do get wear between the blade drive bushing, which is that, that part right here, and the blade drive pin, the, the stud that comes up through the middle. So if that's what you're hearing in terms of the movement, that didn't really do much for you. You gotta make sure that the movement you're seeing or hearing is between the blade drive bushing and the actual adjustment bolts. If you get a lot of wear between the blade drive pin and the blade drive pushing, they just need to be uh, replaced. There's no way to adjust that out. So if it's rattling around on the, the pushing is rattling around on the pin, you just need to replace the sucker. But if you keep them lubed, usually that keeps that wear at a minimum. So that's that. Now there is also uh, an adjustment on this lower blade drive arm. It's got the same style of bushing kind of jammed down in here. It's hard to get to. And interestingly, this blade uh, adjustment bolt, this uses the old style. They never did update this. This is actually the one that slipped through on the back. So these bolts cranked down are actually pinching this in place. But the bottom teeth don't throw nearly as far. They only move about half the range of motion as the top teeth. So this, this style still works okay. So at least once a year, you just check this as well. It's the same thing when this thing is kind of slid all the way over to one side. Let me grab the hammer here and kind of get this thing. It probably is slid all the way over to one side. Yeah, it is actually. You just grab this thing and wiggle it back and forth. Actually, it's still nice and tight. So I think we're okay on that. Another way that you can uh, 
drive this thing back. Another way, you can, if you have the style of blade drive bushings with these grease fittings on them, the grease fitting actually gives you a little bit of a tool that you can use. You can grab a hold of that grease fitting, which is attached to this uh, drive bushing, and wiggle it. Now I can tell right now that I do have this too tight because there's no wiggle at all, which means that blade drive bushing is being pinched between these holes. So I'm going to loosen this up anyway on camera. Okay. Hold that in place while we retighten the nut. Hmm. Well, maybe I didn't move it. Oh yeah, I did. See? Watch. Look at this. I can move that just a little bit now. So that's actually loose. That's good. So I'm going to grab the bottom one and move it back and forth. See the little bit of movement I've got there? That's an acceptable amount of movement. Now if I could move that like a quarter inch or a half an inch, it would mean that the flat side is basically turning around like this and these bolts need to be adjusted. In that case, you would loosen these, tighten these down a little, Again, you bring it down flush, you bring it down kind of snug, and then back it out about an eighth of a turn, retighten this and check it. But that's the procedure. I gotta replace that bolt too. It's screwed up. Okay, other problem areas that you wanna keep an eye on at least once a year, probably put a wrench on that big sucker right there. That nut is holding your whole blade drive arm onto the shaft. Uh, there's also a nut under here doing the same thing for the lower blade drive arm. Sickle bars get a lot of abuse. They go back and forth and back and forth. It's a reciprocating mower, so there's lots of vibration. On a double action bar, you don't feel the vibration as much because the, the fact that the, the sickle is going like this, double reciprocating, takes it kind of absorbs the vibration at the, at the tractor and operator level but the individual components are still going back and forth, so you have to keep an eye on them and make sure things stay tight. These little bearings here, these uh, bearings where the, 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 the uh, spring arms rotate, these bearings usually last for years and years because they're only going back and forth like this. They're not going all the way around, but these can loosen up. Put a wrench on these every year or so. Make sure they're tight. Those are a six millimeter Allen head. Just put something on them. Uh, I'm not sure where the ratchet is here. here it is. Make sure these are tight. Now before the, you check those, you want to make sure to dig out the any crap that may down, be down in them because you want to round out the heads. See, so we got all that junk over there. Put that in. Oop, that is not a six millimeter. Let's not use the wrong size. That's a sure way to screw something up. That is wrong too. Things are not labeled well here, but that's okay. You get the idea. That's not right either. Sorry, folks. There we go. And that, of course, is the wrong size. Half inch drive. Okay. Yay, good and tight. Okay, we won't worry about these then. Actually, the older double action sickle bars used a smaller bolt. They were a uh, they were a six millimeter fastener that took a five. Now that one was a little loose. I'm glad I checked it. Uh, they took a five millimeter uh, Allen head rather than a six. And those older ones had more of a tendency to loosen up because it was a smaller bolt. Uh, so if you've got one of those, definitely keep an eye on these things. Because if those work themselves loose and this bearing assembly breaks, these things are about a hundred bucks a piece. So you do not want to have to buy one. Yep, these are good and tight. Again, you just have this, this one moved a little bit. So you just want to check them all and keep the thing going. Now we have a sickle bar blade sharpening video on our website that applies to both single and double action sickle bars. So you can check that out. We show you how to you know, maintain a good edge on the sickle bar blades. Uh, you will take the blade assembly out for doing that. Um, and that's pretty much it. We also talk about, uh, in one of our videos I think, but I can't remember, uh, we talk about how you want to keep the sickle bars lubricated, um, particularly when you're not using it. The most important time to lubricate a sickle bar, other than when you're putting it together like I'm doing here, is after you're done mowing. Because after you're done mowing, you've got moisture all over the sickle bar, you know, the, the moisture from the grass you've been cutting. So 
if you've got a bare metal blade and you store it with moisture on it, you drive it into the barn and let it sit there, well, that moisture is going to turn into surface rust. The surface rust is going to eventually take the edge off your blades and wear components. So kind of the old farmer way of doing it is you pulled your sickle bar into the barn. You had a, a, a can sitting in the barn, maybe with drain oil in it or something like this. It doesn't take a really high quality oil to get the moisture off. But anyway, you'd have a can with drain oil and an old paintbrush in it. You pull the paintbrush out, swipe it down the length of the bar just to kind of oil it up. Put the PTO in gear, let it run for about five seconds just to work the oil between the moving parts, and you're done. You go back to the house and have a drink. Uh, the oil bonds the metal better than moisture will, so the oil will displace the moisture, and now your sickle bar is uh, dry in the sense that there's no water on it that's going to rust it and it's pre-lubricated for when you bring it out to the field next time. And basically, that's the only time it needs to be lubricated in terms of the actual blade. An exception would be if it's super dry weather and there's really not much moisture in what you're cutting. Then maybe you want to apply a little oil every now and then just to keep the thing moving well and keep wear at a minimum. And we think we've covered everything that you need to know. Um, one more thing on the double actions that I just thought of it. The lower tooth assemblies each one of these is a double. So this is one piece, this is one piece, this is one piece. They're held on by bolts coming in from the bottom. It's, a, it's actually a 13 millimeter bolt head coming up from the bottom under here. Uh, they will work themselves loose occasionally. I would say at least once a year. Well, look, this one was tight, this one was not tight. I got about an eighth of a turn on it. So that's something that if this went back out into service and I hadn't checked that, that would have fallen out in a couple of weeks and the customer would cuss me out. So just go over it, you know. It's once a year. This sickle bar is probably 2015. It's probably never had these bolts tightened, I would guess. Yeah, they're all tightened a little bit. But you keep, keep after things like that, you get a lot better service life. You don't have things fall off in the field. Thanks for watching.